Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this program, Owls of the Forest with Damian Fagan. I'm Laurel Westendorf. I'm part of the programming team at the Deschutes Public Library. Every month we explore a theme in our programming, and this month's theme is timber. If you want to find more free programs, please go to our web calendar at deschuteslibrary.org forward slash calendar, or go to our YouTube channel to find recordings of programs like this one. Our presenter is Damian Fagan. Damian spent several seasons hooting for spotted owls in Utah and New Mexico as a contract biologist. He's a naturalist and freelance writer living in Bend and often frequents forested areas after dark in search of owls. Thank you so much, Damian, for telling us about these denizens of the dark. Thanks, Laurel. Appreciate that. And thanks to the Deschutes Public Library uh, for hosting this program. I always say that the library is my remote office. So I go down to the downtown branch quite a bit. Uh, and thanks to everybody for signing up today and joining me. Um, we're going to look at uh, owls of the forest. Uh, some of these here in Central Oregon, some of these have a pretty wide range. So uh, you may recognize them from other spots during your travels. OK, so I'm going to just share my screen. All right, so there we go. Um, Owls of the Forest, uh, here are the few of the things we'll focus on today. A little bit of identification, their territorial calls, habitat that these owls uh, utilize, prey base, those sorts of things. Um, for those of you having lunch, I have to put a disclaimer in. There is one slide, I don't have a little, um, you know, skull and crossbones on the previous slide, but uh, there's some gutted mice, um, so you might want to, you know, time your uh, sandwich bite just correctly there. And uh, I do have a little quiz at the end as well, so I'm giving you a, a disclaimer there. Uh, it's open book, so um, you know, feel free to use whatever materials you have. Okay, so. Um, so here again, uh, topics um, that the Deschutes Public Library in this timber series has covered, um, you know, physical labor out in the forest, establishment of the Deschutes National Forest, um, ponderosa pines, which are one of my favorite trees, um, timber harvest, a lot more. So today we're going to focus a little bit more on uh, particular group of wildlife that inhabit these forests, and these are the owls. Hopefully you can hear these uh, calls. Um, this is a little northern sawwet owl that's calling there. This is kind of, um, you know, typical cascade forests, uh, thick vegetation. Um, you may not see owls very often, but you hear them a, a fair amount. Classic uh, owl. If anyone knows owls or are familiar with owls, um, great horned owl is probably the number one. Uh, you hear some of the locals call them horned owls because of their ear tufts, but it's probably the most common owl in central Oregon. And um, I've been hearing them here at my house. I live off of um, not Road and Southeast Bend. Um, I get up kind of early, so I hear them about 4.35 in the morning. They're already starting to call their territory or doing their territorial calls for the breeding season. Um, but it's one of the most uh, commonest calls that you might hear. Okay, so sorry about that one. That slide just jumped out of there, why owls? Um, you know, one of the things about searching for owls at night is it takes you into the takes you into a different habitat takes you into a different world than walking in the forest during the daytime uh, at nighttime you, know, you have visibility issues you've got sound uh, all those sorts of things when i first started doing spotted owl surveys i have to admit it took me maybe a couple of weeks until i really felt comfortable walking cross country through the woods at night by myself with only a map and compass, because these were pre GPS days. 
and navigating through the forest and listening for owls. Um, part of that uncomfort was the dark. And then part of it was hearing all these other sounds that you knew were not owls, but were trying to identify what the heck is out there as well. Uh, easy for your imagination to go to uh, the scary parts. Um, but uh, really, it took me a couple of weeks before I really felt comfortable. And um, nowadays, it, it's, uh, it almost feels unnatural to not go out at nighttime. Okay, so anyways, here's uh, some characteristics of owls. Um, most of them are nocturnal, but there are owls you can see out during the day. And we'll talk about those a little bit. Um, their eyes are fixed and they're facing forward. So owls, when they're looking around, have to move their heads to be able to see. They can't just slide their eyes to the side. Um, they're designed for uh, hearing, especially because they're a nocturnal animal. Um, so locating prey or predators um, through their hearing. Uh, silent flight, their flight feathers, and we'll talk about these a little bit. Um, very soft, uh, designed to muffle sound. You can imagine it'd be like a Gary Larson cartoon with a um, owl flying around the middle of the night making all this noise. And of course, all the prey would just scurry away. So be unsuccessful. They're very cryptic in their coloration. Uh, as you can see, some of these pictures here, uh, the top center is a northern spotted owl. And then the little owl on the right is a northern sawwet owl. So uh, pretty cryptic. They blend in during the daytime. They're hard to see. A um, couple other just other features. They lack a crop. So um, a crop is a storage area in kind of the throat pouch of some birds of prey. But owls swallow their prey either whole or maybe rip it up into a couple chunks and swallow it down. Um, they also have this facial disc, which you can see these two owls in the center, kind of that center ring around their face, which acts um, sort of like a parabolic receiver, helps channel sound into their ear canals. So that's why that um, facial disc is there. And then they also have a very limber neck. So they have more vertebrae in their neck than we do as humans. And that allows them to be able to turn their head about 270 degrees. Um, some people used to think these owls could spin their heads around because they would move them so quickly from side to side. Um, but really that range of motion is about 270 degrees. Okay, a couple of owl families uh, that are out there. Most owls are in the typical owl family, uh, the Strigidae. And then the barn owls are in their own family. So there's almost like um, a single species into that family. Here are some different characteristics of them. Um, the big one probably being that the typical owls have that round facial disc. And in barn owls, we'll see a picture of this later on, that facial disc looks a little bit more heart-shaped. Okay, and there's that pectinate toe. Um, where you can see that combing here on the center of the toe, um, which helps for uh, grabbing prey. Owls, um, if you ever have felt an owl or found a dead owl and felt their feathers, they're very soft. Um, the primary feathers, which are part of the flight feathers, um, have these uh, serrations on the edges. And these are designed to help break up airflow as it's coming across the feather, hence reducing any kind of noise. Um, the feathers almost feel a little bit woolly, if you will, um, almost like felt. Um, and that here again, is also designed to um, reduce noise. Um, the secondary feathers, which are on the wings as well, kind of have these, um, not serrations on the edge, but they can almost be like fringe. And here again, that's designed to help this uh, breaking down the wind as it's crossing over the feathers, help them with that silent flight. Okay, here's the little bit of a mouse uh, gutted out picture, but um, 
these birds uh, eat a lot of uh, small rodents, mammals, um, those, that's a big prey item, uh, voles, mice, flying squirrels, but we'll see um, that there's a variety into their diets. So the picture up on the left is from a uh, raptor rehabilitator in the Southwest getting ready to feed uh, a bunch of her uh, owls and hawks. So you know, dinner comes out on a silver tray, a um, bunch of gutted out mice and rats. Owl ingests the whole food and, or the whole prey item, excuse me. And because they can't digest those bones and fur, they make a pellet uh, or a bolus, which they then upchuck. And that's that upper right-hand photograph. So those owl pellets um, are, um, you know, a, a species that they've just consumed and it's the leftover parts they couldn't digest. So if you had a, uh, you know, cool third grade science teacher or maybe even eighth grade, uh, they brought in um, owl pellets uh, that had been sterilized and you'd go through this uh, little science project, tearing apart these pellets to see what the owls consumed. And you'd find um, skulls and leg bones and all these sorts of things. So it's a, a kind of a cool way to be able to see what um, these animals are eating. And uh, it helps researchers a lot of times, especially where they can't observe the owls, uh, obviously feeding on prey, um, you know, in the dark, those sorts of things, it's you know, almost impossible. So you're looking for their pellets to tell you what they've been eating. And um, I remember uh, working on a spotted owl project, finding some pellets, and they had uh, pieces of scorpion in there, which I thought was really cool. Okay, so before we get into the forest owls, we're going to go out and give a little uh, props to those that are out in this open country uh, out here in Eastern Oregon, uh, sagebrush, grasslands, marshlands, those sorts of things. So there is a, um, this is a very utilized habitat. Some of, this is actually a shot on the backside of Pine Mountain. So it's part of the Deschutes National Forest, but it's just a little bit more open habitat. And probably the one that um, is, um, not the most common, but uh, seen a fair amount are burrowing owls. And these little owls utilize abandoned uh, animal burrows, whether they're prairie dogs or badgers or fox or something like that, um, natural depressions in the ground. They were nicknamed howdy owl by uh, settlers moving uh, west across on the Oregon Trail. Um, because these owls would be standing up on the edge of their burrows and almost having that kind of curious facial uh, expression as here are these wagon trains going by and uh, just kind of, you know, taking it all in. Um, their call, which I'm going to play next, is this double noted cuckoo, almost sounds a little uh, dove-like. I mean, I don't think we're able to hear the sounds, oh. um, unfortunately. Okay. If someone out there can hear the sounds, the owl calls, please let me know in the chat, but I cannot. You cannot hear them? Mm -mm. Oh. Okay, sorry. Um, well, oh, you're... wait, someone, someone else did, so I guess keep doing it. <laughs> okay, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll do my best doing some imitations too. So this um, cuckoo is like a cuckoo, cuckoo. Sounds very different than that great horned owl's. So uh, burrowing owls here again, kind of open grassland, open country. Um, there's actually population that's down in Florida using um, kind of those sandy bottoms in some of the uh, wooded or open woodlands there. Um, here again, they feed on a variety of prey items, small mammals, insects, uh, small birds, reptiles. Um, they can run down their prey or they can fly after them. Um, there used to be a myth that uh, 
burrowing owls and rattlesnakes would cohabitate together um, in these burrows. And what uh, researchers found eventually was that it was the uh, burrowing owls that would make a sound sounding like a um, rattlesnake, which would deter any kind of predator from continuing to um, search after the prey. We also have two, and it's true in a lot of birds of prey, the females are larger than the males. And in the burrowing owl, it's kind of a reverse. So it's a little bit of an oddity. Males are bigger than the females. Okay, short-eared owls. These are birds that uh, open grasslands, um, uh, marshy areas, those sorts of things. Um, if any of you go up to the Powell Butte Community Center right now, uh, a little bit before sunset, you can park in the back and there's a, a winter roost of uh, short-eared owls and you might catch them flying over into the agricultural fields, feeding on prey there. Uh, these birds, you can see they have a, a very yellow uh, iris and the black pupil there. Uh, so they kind of a yellow-eyed owl. Um, and their call sounds like a little uh, terrier barking. Hopefully people, hopefully people can hear that one. It's a little bit of kind of a call. Uh, these birds, uh, you might see them out during the day. They might be out at night as well. So they've got um, their act activity period uh, really varies, um, but they're using that facial disc and their really good hearing ability to locate prey in these grasslands and in the marshy areas. So they're kind of floating almost, uh, they have a, almost like a moth type of flight um, circling around these areas, uh, listening for prey. Um, the KBO is the Klamath Bird Observatory. Uh, they do uh, short-eared owl surveys. Um, these are volunteers that uh, uh, get assigned um, blocks uh, throughout the state of Oregon. So if any of you are interested in um, volunteering for this program, you could go onto their website, Klamath Bird Observatory, and uh, look up their short-eared owl surveys. So uh, hawk owls, um, as far as I know, and I've been here maybe uh, 18 years, uh, there's been like one reported hawk owl. There's maybe been more, but they're very rare to come this far south. They're more of a, a far northern boreal forest type of bird. Um, I think the first year we moved here, 2004, this hawk owl was seen out by Horse Butte and put on quite a show for a long time for a lot of folks. Um, so I don't really have a call for this one because, you may never hear it unless you go up to their breeding areas. Uh, and then another open uh, grassland, open uh, habitat bird is the snowy owl, which is a spectacular, large, uh, whitish with this black barring. Um, during some winters, there are um, uh, birds that migrate down from the Arctic and from the north. And um, you can see them throughout Oregon. It seems like mostly over on the west side, um, sometimes out on the coast, um, but also uh, there was one up in the Burns area a few years back that uh, was a real treat to go out and see. Um, people had posted it on a website and um, you could go almost to the exact mile post and there it was perched on a, on a fence post. Uh, barn owls, um, this is also a kind of open country bird, um, although it may be nesting up in um, barns, uh, hence the name, uh, canyon walls, those sorts of things. And this is the one owl that does have that more of a heart-shaped facial disc. So you can kind of see it on this uh, bird that's in the image there. Uh, very black eyes, uh, there's no yellow in their eyes at all. Um, some people called them the church owl because that's, you know, historically where they might roost up in a, um, or nest up in a church steeple or barn 
uh, rafters, um, something like that. They have a really weird kind of shrieky call. Um, some people will say it sounds like steam escaping from an old radiator. So here's this one. So hopefully you can hear that kind of shrieking. Um, they have young that only a mother could love, obviously. They're pretty uh, gangly looking young. And you can see there's quite an age difference there. Uh, the one little owlet in the front um, probably hatched, you know, several days um, earlier versus the one in the back, which is much older. So as these birds lay their eggs, they start to incubate them. So the young develop um, at different times. They don't all develop at the same time. So maybe the oldest ones will be more of the survivors because they obviously can compete for food that the adults are bringing into the nest site versus those real young ones. But if there's plenty of prey, uh, these owls can raise um, quite a number of young per season. Um, let's see here again, uh, as for prey, uh, you know, small mammals, um, young rabbits. So they're not taking adult sized rabbits, um, but occasionally snag a bat out of the air as well. And you'll see that with a lot of these owls that bats, um, probably aren't the main component of their diet, but certainly, uh, one of the prey items that they'll take. I'm always amazed here in Central Oregon that we don't um, hear or get reports of barn owls a lot. I think as you get farther out, like towards Fort Rock, um, out into the more open desert areas, the cliff faces, they're a little more prevalent. But um, Central Oregon, um, occasionally they're heard. Um, I heard one one year sitting out in my hot tub, flying overhead. It was kind of a fun fun way to go owling. Okay, so enough of the open forest uh, or open habitat birds. Uh, let's get into the forest owls now. Okay, so I'm going to kind of go um, little to big in terms of size and also uh, grouping these birds by um, eye color. Um, this first group is going to have yellowish eyes with black pupils, and then the second group will have darker eyes. But um, these little northern pygmy owls are a, a very small owl, um, maybe about the size of a can of beer, um, you know, not very big, um, long tailed, as you can see this one in the, in the photograph. And then on these uh, pygmy owls too, they have these black eye spots on the back of their head, which are false eyes. So if a um, predator is flying about, they might not try to sneak up on this bird because they think, oh, it's looking at me. But that picture there is the back of the head. Uh, if uh, any of you are musicians, um, this might be a uh, kind of key of C uh, that the owls call. Um, they have this little whistled note spaced a couple of seconds apart. Here we go. Now, I should say that all these owls make a variety of calls, um, but their sort of territorial songs are the ones that I'm playing. But they will make trills and whistles and shrieks. Um, there'll be prey delivery calls. There'll be long distance contact calls. Um, there's all sorts of sounds that these owls make. Sometimes, um, out owling and you hear these noises and you just say, yeah, it's an owl, but what is it? It's hard to tell. Um, so one of the things too, um, I'll point out when you're listening to these calls, it's not just so much the, the notes of the calls, but it's the spacing between those notes. Uh, if they're 
like on the pygmy owl, a couple seconds apart, or if they're really rapid together, something like that. Um, so pygmy owls can also be out during the daytime. They can be out during the nighttime. They take a variety of prey. They can take prey bigger than themselves. Um, so they're tough little owls. The probably best way to find them is either um, they're tooting or sometimes they'll get mobbed by other songbirds like chickadees and warblers and jays and things like that that are trying to drive these predators out of their habitat. So if you're home and you hear the birds kind of going nuts in your backyard, you know, step outside, take a look. It might be an owl or some other raptor that's perched there um, trying to hide out from them. Uh, pygmy owls and a lot of these other uh, little smaller owls too will or, or can utilize woodpecker cavities as their nest sites. So hence uh, in the forests, it's really important uh, to maintain um, a number of snags, dead standing trees that uh, woodpeckers have drilled into to, to create their nest sites. They've since abandoned them. And then here comes the secondary cavity nesters like pygmy owls and other birds. Okay, so moving up a little bit bigger, northern sawwet owl. Um, this uh, owl, um, kind of that really uh, thick reddish brown streaking on the front, and then up on its head, if you can see uh, on its forehead, there's kind of white streaking coming down towards that Y of a white uh, eyebrows. Um, this owl's call is a very rapid boop, 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 When I would do spotted owl surveys, if you got a uh, sawwet owl to respond, <clears throat> excuse me, to your, <clears throat> to your tapes, they could continue to call for up to 15 minutes. Um, they would just continuously call. And, uh, you know, you felt really bad, like you're disturbing them. So um, here's this call. All right, so much different than that uh, pygmy owl where the notes are spaced apart, these ones kind of all run together. And these are young that you can, any mother can definitely love. Um, cute little uh, owlets there on a branch. Um, I had one of these solid owls in my yard maybe about three weeks ago. And here again, I, he I heard the jays going crazy. So I went outside and there it was just um, perched in one of our trees here. Um, here again, uh, like the northern pygmy owl, the sawwets can use uh, woodpecker holes, and they can also uh, use, um, excuse me, nest boxes for their uh, breeding sites. Now, boreal owls are kind of a specialty here. They're more of a uh, higher elevation uh, type of owl. You get them up in the subalpine fir, the hemlock forest, kind of up by um, Todd Lake, Broken Top, up in that area. So hearing a bore boreal owl in Central Oregon is a real find. And um, you'll hear they have rapid notes like the saw wet, but it's not a long winded. It's a, it's a little bit shorter uh, series of notes. So for those of you that could hear that, you know, that kind of a really rapid series. Um, I've heard them once in Central Oregon. Um, actually, the first time I heard them, I didn't have any idea what they were. I thought this is a saw wet gone bad, but um, went back and listened to some bird tapes and went, oh, that was a boreal owl. Okay, so here again, a uh, little higher elevation. Um, they're uh, probably year-round residents, so they're staying up at these uh, elevations. Some of these owls uh, may move, depending on prey and obviously how conditions are like during the winter wintertime. Um, but here again, boreal owls, you know, usual, utilizing uh, woodpecker cavities for their nest sites. 
All right, so Western screech owls, uh, these are kind of a little bit bigger than um, the sawwets and the boreal owls. They have what's called a bouncing ball type of call where it sounds like a ball is being dropped on a table and then kind of being forced downward so that it, the bouncing just isn't continuous, but then it gets a little bit more rapid. Kind of this. Sort of trilling at the end there. Um, So in that recording, you have, excuse me. You've got a couple of owls that are duetting. And sometimes with the owls, oops, sorry about that. The um, males have the lower pitch and the females have the higher pitch to the call. So that's one way to distinguish them. Um, I'm not sure I can go backwards, but that fellow who was on the ladder by the nest box, that was a guy, Rich Levad in um, Grand Junction, Colorado. The um, Audubon Society there did a project where they were going around through the neighborhoods where people were uh, cutting down their trees or limbing um, the dead limbs off of trees, but these actually happened to be uh, screech owl or screech owl nest sites. So they went in and put in uh, nest boxes to replace the cavities or the trees, and uh, it was very successful. For those of you that have been on Christmas bird counts, um, there's an owling component that goes on. Um, when you would look at results across the country, the Grand Junction Audubon would report like 120 uh, screech owls because they had a crew, then that's all they did. They went around through the valley Christmas day or the day of the Christmas bird count and um, picking out all these um, screech owls at these nest boxes. So uh, you can see there's a, a grayer, some streaking on it. These birds, you can barely see in the photograph, the little ear tufts that are on top of the head. And those ear tufts aren't where the ears are located. They, they aren't. Uh, associated with that. They're more of uh, helping the bird blend in to their surroundings or being like a visual clue, like a dog's ears laying down, standing up, those sorts of things. Um, the ear cavities are on either side of the head and they're oriented a little bit differently so that the owls can help triangulate or the owls can triangulate that sound and pinpoint where it's coming from. Oops, sorry, slides are jumping. Okay, so here's the long-eared owl. Um, you hear that longer? Wow, this program is just going on its own now. It's, uh, <laughs> it's all excited about owls. Um, so the long-eared, well-named, those you can see those longer ear tufts, kind of orangey facial disc. Um, here again, very cryptic. Um, this picture, like if that owl was all of a sudden being disturbed, it could kind of stand upright more, uh, stick those ear tufts up and try to blend in like it's part of a uh, tree trunk, something like that. So you don't hear these owls very much uh, around Central Oregon in the breeding season, but they're here. Um, but they do form these winter roosts where they can um, come together in almost a, a colony, if you will, um, sharing roost sites in some really thick, dense vegetation. Um, so uh, they're around, they're just, they're my nemesis bird, actually. I, I haven't, I've heard them once in Central Oregon and I've been out trying to hear them quite a bit. So the folks that go out owling with me, they know that this is my, this is my uh, nemesis bird. Okay. Here we have the great horned owl.
So hopefully, wow, you can hear those uh, calls, um, the males and females, a little bit different pitch, um, and uh, but that classic, who's awake, me too. So this is uh, an owl species that's widely dis distributed kind of throughout North America. Um, maybe not up in the Arctic, but um, down in the lower 48 in the woodlands, uh, open areas, um, canyons, neighborhoods, those sorts of things. Uh, you can see the picture down the lower left of a little owl peeking out in a, a rock cavity. Uh, this is its nest site down in the southwest. Uh, great horned owls are tenacious. They'll eat just about everything. Um, doesn't matter if you're a skunk, um, they get sprayed, but they have no sense of smell. So, you know, everything uh, um, smaller than a skunk or a house cat is pretty good prey for um, great horned owls. Um, I used to live in an area where people didn't name their outdoor cats because the great horned owls consume them quite regularly. Okay, so the great gray owl there, and I apologize for these slides, they're just kind of jumping on their own. I'm not uh, forwarding them, that they're just going on their own. But this is uh, one of the classic owls here. It's a great find. Uh, they can be out during the day, they can be out at night as well. They're large owls, they make that deep hooting sound. So they're uh, um, kind of a classic woodland with some open areas. Um, if you think of the Sun River area, where you've got woods on one side of the river, and then this kind of meadow and open fields, um, that's kind of good foraging habitat for these great gray owls. Um, they're a little too big to get into nest cavities, so they'll either use a, a broken off uh, large diameter tree trunk, um, maybe if there's a old uh, magpie, red tail hawk nest, they'll use one of those, but they'll also use these um, platforms, uh, which you can see in the photograph here, um, that ODFNW installed um, in different places throughout the state, and the owls utilize these as their um, nest sites. So here are just kind of a few more photographs just because they're a pretty majestic uh, owl, um, you know, good find. You can see these owls too, even hunting um, in the winter time, they can hear mice and other small mammals uh, moving around underneath the snow. So sometimes if you're out skiing or snowshoeing up in the Cascades and all of a sudden you see this kind of weird depression in the snow, take a look. It may be where an owl landed, snag some prey, and then maybe as it takes off, you'll see there's some uh, wingtip marks in the snow. It's kind of a nice little find. Very intense looking eyes. Okay, so now we're gonna get into some of the darker eyed owls. Uh, you can see there's no yellow in these. And these are the, the first one is the flammulated owl. And um, you can see the uh, owl in the bottom left there being held by a bander, someone who captured and they were banding these owls um, for uh, research purposes. Um, not very big at all. Uh, these uh, owls are also migratory, so um, they're here in the summertime and then they're probably going down to um, Mexico, um, maybe into Central America as well. So they highly migratory. And their calls are very soft. Um, it's almost a single note, and we used to joke because they boop, boop, boop. Or uh, this um, type of call. So here it is.
And you can see there um, on this one, the weight, two ounces. So very lightweight. Um, even a great horned owl that looks huge and massive, it might be two and a half to three pounds. You know, a lot of feathers, hollow bones. Um, they're not super heavy birds. Here again, you know, taking a um, size comparison to someone's hand. Oops, I don't know if I can go back. Nope, sorry. Um, the spot that I always go for flammulated owls during the season, so they don't really come back into Central Oregon, maybe until April, uh, early May, somewhere like that. But I, I go up to the Virginia Meissner Snow Park and can hear them pretty regularly during the early part of the summer up in that area. Uh, spotted owls, uh, you know, it's the classic poster child for conservation versus timber, although it really shouldn't be that kind of an issue, um, but it's sometimes portrayed that way. These birds are an old growth uh, forest inhabitant. Um, they've unfortunately become a threatened species. Um, so they've been listed as under the Endangered Species Act. Um, there's been discussion of them going up into a higher status, endangered species. Um, but at this point, they're just listed uh, as a, excuse me, as a threatened species. The spotted owls, uh, fairly large sized owl, uh, dark eyes. You can see this kind of white spotting. There's a little bit on the top of the forehead and then on the undersides as well. Let's see if the call comes out on this one. But this one sounds more uh, uh, dog barking-ish, if you will, than just hooting. So that's their four note location call there. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, kind of an old growth forest type of bird um, down in the Southwest where I used to uh, survey for spotted owls, they would uh, inhabit these kind of deep narrow canyons um, that either had some stringers of vegetation going up to the rim um, or cavities up in the cliff walls, but kind of mimicked that Northern habitat uh, in terms of being cool and moist. Um, these birds here again eat a variety of prey, but I wanted to point out, and you can see in the photograph, the feet of these owls, where you see two toes pointing forward. So owls have four toes and most birds um, have three going forward and one to the back so that they can grasp onto either prey or grasp onto a branch, something like that. The owls have this ability to rotate one of their outer toes to increase the size of their grip. So if, if my hand's like this, I'm trying to find it. Um, they can spread that toe outwards and just be a larger gripping uh, site for prey. During the early years um, of surveyors going out looking for spotted owls, um, they would uh, bring mice with them. So, you know, captive bred mice. And if they located a spotted owl, they would either put a mouse on a branch or they had little um, kind of almost like fly rods where the mouse was attached to a little um, a clip um, just attached to the back of their neck. And so the researchers would see if the owls came down, snagged the owl, or excuse me, snagged the mouse, did they fly away to a nest site with that mouse? Did they consume it there? And whatever activity these spotted owls did, that indicated something about their nest sites. Almost got to the point where uh, the researchers would drive up in their truck, close the door, and here came the spotted owls They're flying in like, oh, it's, it's the, it's the uh, Uber driver with, uh, you know, delivery eats or something like that. Um, so, uh, kind of an interesting you know, behavior that they could um, associate with humans kind of easily there. 
Okay, so on the other side is the barred owl, which is a similar looking, similar size to the spotted owl, same genus, different species. Um, and this owl is actually um, been expanding its range from the uh, originally in the southeast, uh, kind of Louisiana, if you think of the bayous where it, it would like these wooded areas with open uh, swampy areas to be able to hunt in. Um, but they're very successful in expanding their range and they've been moving up into the Northwest. So years ago, you'd never hear a barred owl or be very rare. Nowadays, it seems like um, you just see posts of them all over the place. So they're becoming much more uh, common. Their uh, uh, sort of mnemonic for their call is who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. So hopefully you could hear that. Um, you can see the middle uh, photograph. This was taken down at Farrell Bend Park a bunch of years ago. There was a barred owl that was hanging out there. People could get fairly close or people got fairly close to get photographs and these sorts of things. Um, and, uh, you know, the owl didn't fly away. How much it stressed the owl, you know, is a question mark. You always want to give these species some more distance. But um, it was very, you know, tons of people saw this owl, uh, very photogenic there. Unlike the spotted owl, the bill on the barred owl is a more yellowish color. It's darker on the spotted owl. Um, but one of the things that these barred owls have been known to do is to hybridize with the spotted owl. So it's, you have a threatened species um, interacting with a, uh, another species and um, it kind of becoming a problem in terms of protecting the spotted owl and trying to maintain that genetic uh, diversity of the spotted owl. Um, barred owls are also very aggressive. So if they move into spotted owl territories, they can easily outcompete those spotted owls, either flat out killing them or intimidating them to the point where the spotted owls don't even want to call and try to be recognized themselves. They're, um, you know, trying to go into the background. So barred owls, uh, in terms of prey, also eating a variety of animals, uh, reptiles and amphibians here again, from some of that um, open kind of marshland areas that they might inhabit. Um, and you can see they're also a cavity nester, but they're not going to utilize, um, uh, nest boxes. I didn't know that one was in there, but that's the male hua call. Okay. Oops. Sorry about that again. Um, so threats to these owls. Obviously there's a variety, you know, you remove their habitat um, that can impact these owls, especially spotted owls, which are uh, looking or utilizing old growth forests. Um, climate change as well, if it's altering uh, fire regimes where maybe these uh, like locally pine forests designed to burn on a, uh, regular but low frequency or, or low intensity type of schedule, now burning at a um, higher intensity and higher frequency. So you're burning up some of their habitat. Um, the B&B &B burn up uh, kind of in the Sisters, Sanium area, uh, definitely burned out a lot of spotted owl habitat uh, back 2002, I believe that one was, or 2003. Um, so maybe some of those birds moved over onto the uh, Willamette side of the forest or moved down into other old growth portions of the forest, but um, that fire certainly burned out a lot of um, that habitat. You also have um, collisions, which especially with vehicles, um, some of these owls low flying, they're coming in after prey, 
um, especially if it's along major highways, um, you know, they're going after prey in the medians or on the uh, sides of the road, get struck by vehicles and uh, don't survive. Um, some of the owls too um, can fall prey to larger owls. I have seen uh, decapitated long-eared owls, which I'm sure a uh, great horned owl got a hold of it and just ripped its head off, um, as well as other raptors that either challenge them for um, nest sites or for prey, um, but you can have um, you know, some problems that way as well. Um, so uh, in terms of going out and hearing these owls, Short of having one in your neighborhood getting mobbed by a bunch of other birds um, and then alerting you to that uh, animal being out there, that owl being out there, you have to go out when these owls are active. And a lot of them, because they're active at night, um, means a lot of night prowling around out there. Um, so if you're Thinking about going out, trying to listen to owls, you know, here's some suggestions that I had. Uh, A, to know where you're going prior to where you're when you're going. So safety being a big concern, if you're pulling off the road or you're going out into the forest, um, you, you don't wanna know where you're going. Um, timing, and here again, the habitat. Um, so like if the flammulated owls are here in the summer, but they're gone in the winter, I wouldn't be going up in the wintertime trying to hear flammulated owls. Um, during the breeding season, it's a really good time because these owls are making calls out there. They're uh, talking to their mates, talking to their neighbors. So it's kind of a good time. Uh, obviously you don't want to try to disturb them, but um, you know that's a prime time when these owls are calling. And then here again, going into the right habitat for whatever you're looking for. Um, silence is golden. It's, it's amazing, I should say, when you're out uh, 1030 at night, you're on a gravel road and you hear one vehicle and it just seems like it's taking forever to get up to where you are and then pass you by. And that sound just sounds enormous. It sounds like it's a highway. So, um, you know, finding areas that are really quiet, trying to um, you know, maintain your own quiet by not moving around, slamming doors, all that sort of stuff, um, because you really have to use your hearing for these owls. Um, and some of them, like the flammulated owl, has a very low pitch. So if you have a little bit of hearing issues with um, that low pitch, it's tough to hear them. Um, a lot of times you wanna just, be able to listen for these owls and uh, occasionally uh, maybe play a call off of a taped recording, but really minimizing that because you have to think of, you know, you're imitating another uh, adult uh, owl and it's a little bit of harassment to say, hey, you know, I'm this pygmy owl in the forest and I'm calling in all pygmy owls. Um, so, uh, you know, very, be very careful with that. Um, there's actually guidelines on some of the um, birding uh, sites, uh, how to minimize this and really, um, you know, not be so disturbing. If, um, and here again too, if you uh, play tapes, um, you know, you get a response, don't keep playing it. You've heard the owl or it's calling. So don't try to, you know, keep luring it in or something like that. Uh, bring extra batteries. I, that's one um, from experience uh, being out in the middle of the forest and all my batteries dying in my headlamp and literally, um, you know, walking around blind out there. So um, if I go owling and I'm hiking, you know, I'm probably like um, the Fred Meyer of batteries in my pack. I, I've got tons of them. And then here again, um, early morning or night. Um, 
it's the activity time period of these owls. It's also a little bit quieter. So, you know, during the day, you know, you might hear owls calling or you could see them, but really your success is going to be more evening, early morning. Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so those resources, um, if anyone has any questions, I can post those back up or I can send you those, but um, there's a lot of uh, owl, owling groups out there. Um, there's tons of resources on the website. Um, one of my um, favorites is uh, this site eBird, for those of you that, uh, electronically record your bird sightings because you can go through and you can search the website and see what other people have been seeing or hearing. So it's kind of a nice way to see what folks are encountering out there. Um, I also have a, a two CD set called Voices of North American Owls. And it's a great one because it's got just a whole variety of calls and songs by each individual species. So it's all those shrieks and whistles and grunts and groans and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's really a good uh, resource. Okay, so open book quiz time. Um, you, you know, don't raise your hands. You can fill in the chat if you want, but really it's just for you. Um, to see what you've picked up from this talk. So here's the first species, and it's called. And so the first one, Northern Pygmy Owl. Okay, so here's this guy and give you its call. So who cooks for you, who cooks for you all call of the barred owl. I do have a call for this one. So um, long-eared owl, kind of that orangey facial disc, the ear tufts um, being a long and also a little bit closer on the forehead. I don't think I mentioned that earlier. Whereas the great horned owl, those big ear tufts are uh, more on the outer part of the head there. So long-eared owl. So I like to throw that one in because that's sometimes um, what happens when you're out owling. You either get a really quick glimpse at a bird or you just hear a couple of notes or something like that. The bird doesn't um, keep calling or it flew away or something like that. So that's where you've got, you know, use that silence as golden, really be attuned when you get out of the car or if you're walking around um, because sometimes it's, uh, you know, the birds are, it's a quick sighting. So that one was the uh, great gray owl. And then here, kind of the classic, you're out in the middle of the night and you're standing around listening. All right, and I like this one. Um, yeah, I'm my, I'm my own self entertainment sometimes, but uh, it happens where you're out listening and you hear one species. The first one was the great gray owl with those deep, hoo, 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 
type of call. And then a great horned owl or two great horned owls start to respond. Um, so it's uh, possible to have more than one owl calling or more than one species calling at the same time. So just as a, um, a little caveat, uh, and if you hear that, it's, it's pretty exciting. Okay, so here's just a few uh, references, but I also wanted to thank the um, Shoots Public Library for having me and for these photographers that have uh, donated some of their slides. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the program. Sorry about some of those slides jumping ahead. Um, I'm not sure the program's kind of on its own some days, but um, if you have any questions, uh, I'll go through them now. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Damian. So we have a couple questions. Um, one, you may have answered already, but what is the title food processor, processor designate um, regarding owls? So it's just that they're taking that, those prey items, and in that picture, they were the mice and rats. And uh, basically, as they ingest them, they're processing that food. So they're digesting all the meat. They can't digest the bones and fur. Up chuck those pellets. Uh, one thing they didn't mention is that if you find a spot where there are a lot of pellets on the ground, that's a good spot to go back to because obviously it's a favorite perch of one of those owls. So you may be able to find that owl at that spot. Uh, another one was, do burrowing owls literally run after their prey? Uh, they can. Um, here again, if it's something uh, close by to where they are, you can see if they're standing up on those little uh, mounds or they're up on a fence post, they could run something down if it's really close. But, um, you know, flight is faster, so they could uh, fly after them as well. It, this struck me, it, it struck me as odd that you called them a raptor, an owl, a raptor, even though it may seem really obvious to other people. But for me, I was like, oh, a raptor, that's a, a peregrine falcon or a, a red-tailed hawk. But I was surprised that that's an owl. Yeah, and a raptor is a generic term, you know, for all birds of prey. So it could be hawks, eagles, owls, falcons, that sort of thing. And unless, feel free to ask any other questions, folks. But the last question I had was, you've called their coloration cryptic. And, you know, when I imagine cryptic, it's like, you know, creepy or, oh. and are you, are you, what do you mean by cryptic? By cryptic, I mean it's it's blending into the background. It's almost a like camouflage. So they're very, um, uh, like if an owl is even perched next to a tree trunk, they're really hard to see. So in terms of, um, maybe it's not the best word to use that, um, just meaning they're blending into their surroundings. Mm, just well camouflaged. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, this has been a very informative talk. Um, I'll get the resources from that slide from Damien and send them out in a follow-up email to everyone. And this program was recorded, and I'll send the link out as well. So please feel free to share with folks uh, you know that might be interested. And you can always look up some of those owl calls on YouTube um, and hear them. But I loved your impersonations, Damien. They were wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, self entertainment. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, he's really good at this. So, <laughs> so thank you very much, Damien, for taking the time to share your vast knowledge of owls with us. Well, thanks for having me, Laurel. I appreciate it. Yep. All right. Have a good rest of your day, everyone. Bye.